This is part seven of Pediatric Musculoskeletal Disorders, and it is the last of the video lectures. It's going to address Osgood Schlatter's disease, slipped capital femoral epiphysis, and leg calf perthes disease. There are additional YouTube videos posted on Blackboard about leg calf perthes and SCFE. We're going to start out with Osgood Schlatter's disease. This is a problem that results from overuse. So we're gonna see it in our adolescent population, um, maybe even our school age where they started in things like soccer or football at a very young age. And it's very common in athletes. And what they complain about is when they're active, especially running, they have pain and they'll start really reporting it when it's also painful when they're walking. And what they have is swelling of the tibial tubercle. So I want all of you to just reach your fingers down, feel your patella, and they'll go down a little bit further and you're going to feel that notch at the top of your tibia. That is your tibial tubercle. So what happens with Osgood Slatter's disease is the patellar tendon tears away from the bone and it causes swelling and pain. The treatment for this is rest. Now try telling an adolescent who wants to be a soccer star that you know what? You have to rest. And what do they do? They continue playing and this becomes a huge problem and they'll develop a lesion like the picture on the bottom. You see that big knob? And that's from continued playing. We also treat it with non anti-inflammatory drugs and they can apply a cold pack after exercise. Your parent and patient education needs to reinforce that this will get better with a tincture of time. And what that means is allow the treatment to actually work before you put this extremity to use again. They can get up and they can walk, but they shouldn't participate in any type of running type of activities. Bicycling might be okay because there's not that much weight bearing, but they shouldn't go all out on this activity because it still requires that flexion of the knee that's going to pull on the tendon. Our next disorder is slipped capital femoral epiphysis. And it is exactly what that title means. The epiphysis at the top of the femur slips away. It tends to be more frequent in boys than girls. And what happens is the femoral epiphysis slips off posteriorly from the growth plate. It can be subtle or it can be an acute onset. And most of the time, these kids are going to be overweight or obese. And what they complain about is pain with activity. They feel a pain that radiates into the groin, down the thigh, and they may have hip pain. And an astute teacher will notice that the kid out on the playground, all of a sudden, he's limping. When the child comes in, ortho will find that there's pain when we internally rotate the hip. So what do we do for this? We need to put them in the OR. Initially, the child may be put in traction just until we get them into the OR, and what this does is it decreases the muscle spasm that's creating the pain. And it also prevents this kid from moving any further and causing the slip to be more profound. So they do a percutaneous pin placement, and it literally just pins the growth plate back onto the head of the femur. Postoperatively, pain management will be one of your jobs, making sure that this kid still moves in the bed, but he's not going to be able, he, and it might be a she, will not be able to bear weight for between one and six weeks. And it's usually closer to that six week mark than the one week mark. It de depends on the degree of the slippage. So physical therapy is going to come day one post-op, and get this kid up on crutches. And they're ready for discharge. Once they, we know that the pain is under control, the kid can get around in crutches, they're going to go home. Now, one of the risks for developing this is overweight and obesity. 
And so this is another part of your nursing intervention is to start the discussion of good nutrition. Get our dietitians in to talk to the family as well as the child. Remember, this is adolescence. They're in charge of what they're eating. So we want to address junk food, excessive eating. And remember, they're not going to be moving like they used to be. So the calorie intake needs to be less. So the pin is going to stay in and can be removed a couple of years later. So that's SCFE. The next disorder is leg calf perthes disease. Be careful when you type this because your autocorrect is going to change the way this looks. Doesn't like this disease the way it's spelled. This is an interesting disease also in that a child develops avascular necrosis at the head of the femur. Why it happens, we don't know. But it, occur it occurs over and over and over until finally the head of the femur completely collapses or it can partially collapse. Later, the head of the femur is able to reossify itself and it will restore the epiphysis. This tends to occur in boys more than girls also, but it's more in your school age, age 4 to 10 years. How do we treat it? Tincture of time. Pick a nice place to heal in order to recuperate. So once again, when we look at the pathophysiology of this disorder, aseptic necrosis, as in it wasn't caused by a bacteria, a virus, or a fungus. And it, it causes a synovitis, that's the synovium, in the joint. It takes up to a year for the joint to completely revascularize. And the next slide, I have a picture of where the areas have been infarcted. So the bone does regenerate, and in a worst case scenario, the child may need to have surgical repair, but we try and avoid that. So take a moment to look at the normal vasculature on the head of the femur versus the infarcted area. Our inpatient interventions include immobilization of the affected joint. They may be put in traction or casts, and if either of these are used, you need to do a neurovascular assessment. Assess their range of motion, and what you may notice also is there's wasting of the quadricep muscle. When the child is laying and even standing, it may not be as obvious. And so what we do is we actually measure it and we'll find that there is a one to two centimeter difference between the quads. There also may be a leg length discrepancy because after all, this femur no longer has its ball part of the joint and so it's, it's much shorter. When the child is placed in a brace, you need to assess the skin for breakdown. And then pain management. It's not an extremely painful process, so non-steroidals for a short period of time can be used or will use IV narcotics. We want to provide active and passive range of motion so that the joint continues to be mobile and we promote the muscle strength, provide diversional activities for the child, and of course safety measures because they're not going to be very stable, especially if they're put in this brace, and prepare them for management of the disorder at home. And here's a picture of the brace that the child can wear. So it's a broad-based gait. We don't want them running around in it, and they need to be wearing this all the time, but it can come off for them to take a bath but they need to be very careful getting in and out of a tub, and we don't want them falling. So interventions for discharge. The activity restrictions, there can be no weight bearing whatsoever for up to two years in severe cases. Some of them may use crutches, and they can do limited weight bearing with the crutch and we want to teach them how to do the range of motion exercises at home. We need to teach them how to care for the brace, how to put it on, how to take it off. If the child had a surgical correction, then of course we're going to teach them wound care. Discuss body image issues. 
the younger the child, it's less of a problem. But when we're looking at these eight, nine, and 10 year olds where they're starting to look at their peers and peers are looking at them and they look funny and different and they have some body image issues. Remember the skincare, it's subject to breakdown. And if necessary, we can apply foam underneath the brace to protect the bony prominences so that they don't have the breakdown. And this ends part seven of pediatric musculoskeletal disorders. Yeah.